Okay, we're here with Melissa Miller, and she's running for the uh, Montgomery County District Clerk's position. And I'm John Wirtz, Montgomery County Tea Party. And with me is uh, Maureen Ball, uh, Del Fessenden, Bob Bagley, Dennis Tibbs, Pat Tibbs, and Larry Rogers. And as we discuss, we'll go ahead and open it up with uh, uh, your five minute opening. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Melissa Miller. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, I want to start by giving you a brief background of myself. Um, I am married to Jason Miller and we have been married for 19 years. We have two beautiful children, Noah and Sophia. I graduated from Conroe High School in 1996 and that was, I only went to high school for three years. I graduated a year early ahead of my class. So. Um, I attend Security First Baptist Church, where I am a helper in the Awanas program. I am a Christian, a wife, a mother, and I'm invested in our community. We have lived here, uh, my husband and I, like I said, have been married for 19 years. We've lived here that entire time. Before that, I've lived here with my family, my mom and my dad, since I was three. So we've been here, we're invested in the community, and we don't plan on going anywhere. And you might ask why that is important and why I'm even talking about it. Uh, last week, there was a tra travesty to justice in our community. And I'm sure everyone's aware of the Larry Swearingen incident. Um, he was granted a stay of execution because the district clerk made an error. She failed to send the, the paperwork, the execution order, to the proper place. This case has been ongoing for more than 17 years. Uh, when I first started with the district clerk's office, I started in May of 98, and December of 98 is when this case started. I'm very well versed in the case. I understand the procedures and everything that that case has gone through. This injustice hits our community hard. The community in which we all live, we raise our children, we work. It's very important. And most importantly, it's hit the Trotter family again. They thought that there was an end in sight, and now they have no justice. Again, it's been delayed. This, to me, is unacceptable. Um, our community, and definitely the Trotters, deserve better. They deserve to have their day and the justice to be made. Uh, most of us have labeled this a clerical error, but thinking on it, it really is a dire election of duty. Because of this, the Trotters will have to go through another Christmas suffering through this incident again. And what occurred, the execution order was mailed to the wrong office. It is incumbent upon all elected officials to ensure that their duties are done properly. And there needs to be a change. And you cannot accept someone with no experience within the district clerk's office, no one that has worked there as a candidate. And you can't accept the incumbent who is practically retired in place. I have 19 years of experience. I have an outstanding relationship within the legal community. And during those 19 years, I could not make any policy changes or procedure changes. And I'm asking for the taxpayers to give me that ability now. It is time for a positive change, and I'm ready to be that change. I'm ready to be that leader, and I'm ready to serve as the next district clerk and give that office what it deserves, the leadership it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Melissa, you know, you just touched on the Swearingen, Swearingen issue there, uh, calling it a derelict, a derelict of duty. What is, is this a common? Uh, not really a common occurrence, but does it really happen that much at all? And how much of the county is it going to, uh, the county's tax uh, money or, or Texas, the state of Texas, how much is that going to cost uh, the taxpayers when it's all said and done between incarceration, further incarceration, Mr. Swearingen, and also any potential legal fees that come along with that? <clears throat> to the part of the question, how often does it happen? Death warrants and execution orders are not common. They're not a daily process. 
They're not a monthly process. They're not even a yearly process. Within the 19 years that I've been there, I have seen death warrants for Jonathan Green, Keith Thurmond, uh, James Perry, and Hilton Crawford, and of course, Swearingen. That's five that I can count on and remember. It's not something that happens every day. It should be when that, when a death warrant comes across and is ready to be issued, that should be your top priority. You should refresh yourself on the code before you issue it and make sure that everything is done correctly. Um, as far as cost-wise, there is a cost associated with it. Um, there will be more legal fees. Uh, the attorneys have filed motions. Um, the cost of him staying on death row, I believe, uh, is about $200 to $300 a day. He gets an automatic 90 days. There, the execution cannot be set within 90 days. So you'll have to wait another 90 days for him to even get an execution date. So it, it isn't something that's going to remedy itself overnight. It's not like you can just resend the order and everything's going to be okay. No, the process has to start over again. Documents have to be prepared. The warrant has to be issued again. Um, so the cost can grow quite quickly. So it doesn't, doesn't happen that often. Does something like that fall to a deputy clerk to issue? Or is this something that the district clerk should be, like I said, right on top of and almost hand carried all the way through the process? Right. It is something so severe that I feel the district clerk herself should be handling. Um, she does. Yeah, okay. go ahead. She does have a post judgment department that handles these items, um, but the death warrant ultimately has to be signed by her and she should be proofing and making sure that everything was sent properly. If she isn't going to do it herself, she needs to at least proof it and make sure and see to it that everything was done properly. Right. It's the ultimate responsibility of the district clerk to make sure that that is done. Okay, thank you. Uh, my understanding is the order um, specified where it was supposed to be sent and it yes. was actually sent to another address. Yes. Um, it seems like someone in the clerk's office should have noticed that and brought it to her attention at least. So what would you do to make sure your, um, the assistants are willing to come to you to suggest that maybe something was, you know, wasn't proofread well enough or <coughs> something needed to be changed? That's a very good question. Communication is key in any organization. If you have a failure to communicate within your department, then that causes a breakdown in job and in production, and that's very important. To me, communication is key. Um, and one of the things that I'm running on is training and communication and accountability. Um, the staff needs to be trained properly. They need to have all the tools. They need supervisors that understand the statutes and know how to read the statutes and research items. And then again, it goes back to overseeing Something that important, something that rare, should be looked at by more than just one person and should be reviewed by the district clerk herself to ensure that the process was done properly. Uh, what changes would you make um, related to communication? Communication? Um, I think making the employees aware that, that it's open, you can come talk to me, being there for them, um, being visible, and knowing that they have that relationship to come talk, that there's an issue that they need to discuss. But in order to have communication, you have to be there and be seen and be visible, and they have to know that they can come talk to you. And I think you mentioned some training, or is there some training available to the district clerk and uh, assistants that are not, not being utilized? There is training. Um, for the clerk themselves, they're required to have 21 to 24 hours of continuing education a year. Um, so those resources are available through the associations. Uh, it's very valuable and very important that you utilize that. And a lot of them are legislative updates that you get when you go to those conferences. And is that just for district clerks or also the assistant? The district clerk can go and she can designate people to go with her or send someone in her place. But if she sends someone in her place, she does not get the credit for or the district clerk does not get the credit for that conference okay. to go towards her CLEs. Okay. 
Okay, my understanding is the district clerk deals with the uh, district uh, courts and the uh, courts of law. Do you also just uh, deal with the JP courts? No. Okay. Do you have any experience or knowledge of the Graves Humphrey stall net data system? Net data. I do have a little bit of knowledge from net data. Um, when we were looking at the new case management system, I was one of the people that were uh, designated on the team to go and look at the different vendors that were coming through. Uh, net data was presented to us um, at the time. It felt to me and just my own personal knowledge of what we had going into it, the computer system that we had presently in place going into it, looking at the different vendors, that net data was pretty much the same software that we were already using. So it wasn't, to me personally, it didn't feel like we were moving forward any. Um, and there were some questions that were asked that they couldn't answer. So. Do you have any insights on the current controversy over the use of that system? No, I really don't. Okay. Okay, let me use a little bit of time here. Um, your background was in the, um, the district clerk office, and yes, you um, changed to the county clerk office. Yes, sir. Um, in reading what you've written, it, it appears you felt you were, up to a certain point, being groomed as a successor to the current district clerk. Yes. Were there others that were also potential successors? Were you the only one or that you were aware of? To my knowledge, I was the only one. Okay. And um, could you elaborate a little bit on the switch to county clerk? Because... It's not obvious to me that if she chose not to retire right now, that that would necessitate a move, so. Sure. And um, like you said, uh, leading up to it, I was being groomed to take her place. I uh, started going to different events with her. She started introducing me to people. Um, I continued on. We had a conversation at one point in July of 2016 where she told me that she was going to retire, that I needed to pursue my campaign, file my treasurer, go talk to Dr. Wilkerson, do a number of things to initiate the process formally and begin my campaign. Um, over the next several months, um, events occurred and Till ultimately, I believe it was Mother's Day weekend in May, she came into my office one afternoon and basically told me that she changed her mind and I either needed to drop out of the race or quit my job. And that I didn't have to decide at that very moment, but she would expect a decision soon. Uh, so I obviously went home over the weekend, discussed it with my husband, and from there things just progressed. Okay, I understand. I've got the picture. Okay, Bob. So going back to the computer program, um, there's there's a lot of issues from what I understand in, in different county offices where um, some are still green screens. Um, <laughs> do you do you know of updates or programs that are needed for that office to be able to to be able not only to help the employees, but to be able to help the lawyers to be able to get to access to the files and um, things like that. For the district clerk's office in particular, the Odyssey system has releases that come out all the time, and you have to be able to upgrade and move to those. Um, and in order to do that, you need someone that is versed in Odyssey. I took on the implementation of it for the district clerk's office. There were two of us at the time. It was myself and Bobby Miller. She was over the finance department at the time. We headed that project. Uh, we were put in charge of it by Ms. Adamic, and we went to numerous hours of data programming, conversion. You know, you had to basically learn the system from the back end forward. And we did that, it was grueling, but we did it. Um, we moved forward, we were able to go live. 
And I'm saying that because you have to have the knowledge of the system in order to make it progress. Uh, Odyssey themselves, the Tyler people, um, they would send other counties to talk to me and Bobby about the system, like how did y'all utilize this, how did you do that, and we would you know, help them out when we could. Uh, it's very key. In order to make that progression, you have to have the knowledge. Right now there is no knowledge in the Odyssey system left in that office. Um, there are updates, uh, and I keep up with everything. They still have me on the data committee, so I keep up with everything knowing what's going on from the county clerk's perspective and where we are and where we're moving forward. Uh, to make things better for the attorneys, there are things coming that are in the updates and the new releases. It's just getting there to that point. So how big operation is the district clerk? How many people are there? How many desks? How many different buildings or rooms? And the, would you as the clerk go to all of those? There are 66 current employees. I believe 59 of them are full-time and seven are part-time. There are three locations, the main courthouse in downtown Conroe. There is a location in the Keyshan building that houses the attorney general, um, the jury selection, the jury department, and then also passports. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is an also a passport location in the Woodlands. I don't know we had an attorney general. We have a county attorney general? Well, what it's called, it's labeled the attorney general. What they do is they handle all of the paperwork that's being filed for the attorney general's office. They handle the, so all the oh, child okay. support paperwork, all of their um, pleadings that are coming in, their suits, issuing the service, things like that. And would the clerk need to go to those uh, each once a week or every day? Or I, I believe ever? you should check in on your departments daily. Yeah. Is there a requirement for district clerks to show up for work? I mean, seriously, I think like uh, constables, they don't they don't have a, a schedule that says they have to show up. They just have to get the job. Sheriff or county commissioners. I think that's every elected official, oh, okay. but yeah. I believe in order to do the job, you have to show up. And, and how long do you have to work to be able to retire from the county? Me, myself, well, or just general in general? Yeah. Um, I believe they have the rule of 75, so you have to work. Oh, Your age okay. plus years of service have to equal, I believe it's 75. No. It might be 80 now. You don't have to work till you're 75, though. No, the rule, <laughs> no, your age plus years of service have to equal uh, a certain number. And, and is the current clerk pretty close to that? Past it. Okay. Past due. All right, thanks. Full that one, Yes. Yeah. In your answers, you talked about uh, how you started out in 1998. You started with the uh, district clerk's office. You then became a supervisor. Then you became office manager. And then you changed over and you now work for the county clerk's office. Mm -hmm. Could you give me a reason and, and the, the what happened why you're not still with the county clerk's office or district clerk's but, office? We already talked about it, Larry. What? We already talked about it. I mean, I can go over it again if you like. No. Um, there was an instance where yeah, well, I was running, okay. and she was supporting me, and then she yeah. changed her mind. And, yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, three locations, mm -hmm. would there be a way to combine those into one location for better supervision? Yes, if you downsize. If you start reducing staff, you could possibly reduce the size of your office. Okay. Um, let me go back to the software issue. You said that uh, there were some people with that data that could not answer questions. Mm -hmm. Were those programmers or were those sales reps or? I believe they were the sales reps. Okay. That's who comes and presents the product to you. And, and they didn't have a tech person there? I like a honestly developer can't that you remember didn't know? Okay. so long ago. Oh, okay. All right, because I used to sell software and I always drug a tech person along with me when I, I think I had I was, a very technical question that yeah. not necessarily technical but 
procedural and it yeah. had to do with grand jury payments and reporting that to the state and that's not something that everybody has knowledge of mm -hmm. so I think I kind of blinded blindsided them with a question that nobody had ever asked them before yeah okay well a lot of times you put user-defined fields in there that you can tweak and right. put that sort of thing in there mm -hmm. so even as a sales guy, I knew that. Anyway, okay, um, wow. Um, okay, so let's go back to the, to the hours. Um, it was reported in the Golden Hammer this morning that eight current district clerk employees, along with four former employees, claim that the current district clerk only worked just over 600 hours in 2015, which if the math is correct is about three hours a day. Then about 800 in 2016 and 614 this year, all roughly about three hours a day. Um, and someone said that Miss Adamic abuses the privileges of position for her own benefit, and she is wrong to do this. Uh, since you have worked in that office, would you say this is fairly accurate statement of the current district clerk um, and their uh, office appearance? I would first start out by stating that Miss Adamic suffered a very tragic incident to her family where she lost her son-in-law and her daughter was left virtually incapacitated. She could not care for herself. She required 24-hour, seven days a week assistance. Um, I wouldn't wish that upon anybody at all. I mean, that's something that's very tragic. It did take her away from the office. It did reduce the amount of hours that she was actually able to come in and work. Um, and like I said, it, you know, it, it is very tragic thing that happened to her and as a mother I don't fault her for wanting to take care of her family uh, but as a citizen and a taxpayer mm. at a certain point you have to recognize when that responsibility and your work responsibility are overlapping and you need to make an adjustment in your life yeah okay thanks and the district clerk's office, they take care of all types of civil cases, including CPS cases, family law, um, litigation, as well as criminal cases. So with that, sometimes the records are sealed. Yes. And what's the procedure um, related to sealing those records? Some are sealed by operation of law. Or not operation of law, I'm sorry, that's not the correct terminology, but by statute they are sealed. Um, like CPS cases are sealed by statute. Um, Adoptions are sealed by statute. Terminations become sealed once the order is signed by statute. Uh, criminal cases are not public record until the warrant has been executed. That's the process for those types of cases. For other types, um, there has to be a hearing where the parties plead to the court for the case to be sealed and the order has to be signed in order for the case to actually be sealed. You can't just go in and seal a case because you feel like it should be sealed. And there are policies and procedures and statutes that protect from that. And not just cases, but documents within cases can be sealed. So your case could be public record, but there could be certain documents within the case that need to be sealed. And again, there's a procedure for that. And I believe you have to have a notice put out in the place where public meeting notices are held. It's a civil rule, rule of civil procedure that addresses that. Um, all of those criteria have to be met before your hearing is held, and then again, the judge has to sign an order to deem something to be sealed. So. Um, and with that, though, your department ultimately is responsible for sealing the records. Yes. Closing it off, I guess, in the computer system. Mm -hmm. So, who in your department has access to look at those records even after they've been sealed to the public? And would you change anything related to that? That's a good question. I actually set that up in Odyssey. So. <laughs> It was all um, a programming. Again, you can program the system. Uh, it's rights and roles driven, so you can give certain access to certain employees, and some employees will never see anything. Uh, 
I feel that an entry level position, someone coming in that just started, shouldn't see certain types of cases. They shouldn't even know they exist uh, until they receive the proper training that they need to know what you can and cannot say to the public regarding those cases. <coughs> so I would say that it needs to go not only on training, but the level of which you're doing your job. So each level has a different job requirement. And I believe that it needs to be evaluated and looked at in that way. Supervisors, ultimately, we have the most access in the office, but the judges would probably have the most access. Even things to supervisors should be sealed off, and only certain supervisors at the highest level should have certain access. Okay, as uh, start off with a quick one. The, um, as previously discussed, the, the swear engine orders were misaddressed and so forth, whatever level of mistake or whatever level of terminology you choose to use. How often, to your awareness, are those type things? Is that once a week, once a year, once a month? Uh, how often do things, mistakes, obviously not of that magnitude, but still mistakes that should have been prevented, how often do they make? Um. Mistakes can be made on a daily basis. Uh, you know, you have new employees coming in that may not have received the proper training and don't necessarily understand um, a procedure. They can make a mistake. Um, it's imperative that you train your employees properly and give them the tools they need. And kind of go back, go back to Ms. Ball's question about levels of security. Uh, but anybody can make a mistake. I mean, we're all human. We operate on a daily basis, and we all try not to make mistakes, but it, it's possible. And most mistakes aren't to that magnitude. Um, it could be easily be as easy as putting the wrong address on a citation when the address changed, and you just didn't look at the right document when you were issuing the citation, uh, or misspelling someone's name when you're entering it in the computer system. So preventing all mistakes, I believe, would probably be impossible, but reducing them is definitely possible. Okay. Um, and with any remaining time, uh, how much time compared to your, your past 19 years, if you were elected to this position, how much time would it take in relation to more time, less time, if it's more time, it's taking time away from your other responsibilities, family, and so forth. So would you please discuss that angle of things a little bit? I'm not sure I understand the question. Mm -hmm. well, right. If you are elected, mm -hmm. is it going to take more time than you have, has been required of you heretofore? I don't think so. I don't think it would take any more time than what I've already invested. Um, working there for 19 years. I was there Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. I only missed on rare occasions. Uh, my husband and I have a very good system of handling our two children. When they're ill, we take turns. It's not solely on my behalf. You know, he helps out and I help out. We always ask each other, well, whose turn is it? <laughs> and, you know, we make it work and we look at calendars and schedules and if he has important meetings that he can't miss and my calendar's free, Obviously, I would stay home with them, uh, but I, my mom also lives right around the corner, and she's very good at helping us as well. So, honestly, I, I don't miss a lot of work as it is. Um, my kids are pretty healthy, uh, other than their extracurricular activities, which are after five. So, I don't, I don't see any investment as a problem to me. I, I so, you'd anticipate about the same work schedule? Yes. Okay. Definitely, I would be there Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, unless I was on vacation or one of my children were sick and it was my turn. <laughs> we're just short about two-thirds of the way through. Okay. We talked about the possibility of consolidating. Mm -hmm. um, that may or may not be good for the taxpayers because you've got, right now you've got two different locations for, um, for passports. Mm -hmm. um, but is there a possibility of cutting back on, on staff? Or is the... Uh, the management side top-heavy. Um, I'll start by first addressing passports. 
we are having in passports. Passports is not a mandated function of the district clerk's office, meaning they're not required to do it. It's an optional service that you can provide to the taxpayers. Um, cost efficiency is the question. Um, I've looked at the budget regarding passports. It's kind of convoluted. You can't really tell how many people are doing passports by the budget or what they're actually spending or bringing in. Um, it isn't a money-making institution, and the district clerk's office should not be viewed as an organization that should be a profit organization. Um, so right off the bat, yes, you could probably reduce staff by just simply reducing the passport office because, like I said, it's not mandated and we don't need seven full-time people operating something that isn't mandated for us to do. How's management though? Is upper management top heavy? Um, there could probably be some cutbacks in upper management. Okay. Did you say you could or couldn't put a cost associated to those seven full-time employees? I could not um, identify the costs within the budget because oh, okay. they're not broken out. They're mixed in as and labeled as regular employees, so you can't tell who is actually working in passports to get. Okay. My only knowledge of the seven people is from working there. I know how many people work in passports on a daily basis. Right. Okay. So when did you actually leave the, the district clerk's office? June 16th or 23rd, I believe. It was a Monday at 4.30 in the afternoon. Okay. <laughs> this year? Yes, sir. 2017. Exactly. 4.30. Uh, so they walked out at 4.30. <laughs> the district clerk's office mostly deals with documents from the district courts, right? And yes. Except for the oddball passport thing. You don't issue uh, birth certificates or death certificates no. or other things like that. The only thing we do with um, birth certificates, they might file a lawsuit if there's a delayed birth certificate, but you have to go through the district court to obtain that. Mm -hmm. So there would be a lawsuit filed to and obtain a delayed birth certificate. Nothing for marriage licenses unless it went to court for some reason, huh? No, nothing for marriage. So most of the people that come in, are they related to the courts and lawyers and that sort of thing? Do people come from Magnolia or New Caney to the district court's office to get anything? And they might come to pay a fee if they're um, on felony probation or they've been convicted of a felony and they need to pay a fee, they might come to our office to pay that. Uh, otherwise, it is pretty much just litigants in a case or attorneys. So without the passports, uh, everyone could be in one office or one building at least? Huh? It, it could be possible. Well, is that something that like 10% of uh, district court offices do, or half of them, or most of them? Or, or district clerks issuing district passports? Mm -hmm. I don't think they all make it a yeah. priority. Okay. I think it's okay. just a, if we can do it, we'll do it for you, come by. If not, I, I've spoken to other counties about it, and it doesn't seem that everybody makes it a priority to make their own division out of it. Okay. And some of the judges that we've interviewed, Say they have things like uh, lunch and learn with lawyers about new laws mm -hmm. and things like that. Do, would your people get involved in something like that? Or Most your definitely. Family? I would go. Okay. Most definitely. There's always an opportunity to learn and we need to be there. Okay. If we're invited and we're able to get. Yeah. When you seal documents, uh, and I guess this applies to the whole legal world, not just you, what do you do about all the the copies that other people have. I mean, you can't go to people's houses to take the documents. All you can do is, is make it off limits on the computer or right. burn your files or whatever. Right. So the best the best example of that would probably be an expunction. Mm -hmm. Someone comes in to get their criminal record expunged and, um, you know, someone's criminal record could be on 10 million websites by the end of the day. Yeah. And there's no way to retract all of that back. Uh, so you, you can only focus on what you have and what the other entities are giving to you to destroy and take care of for the expunction. And you, you physically shred that stuff? After a year, if there is physical paperwork, which is starting to become more and more rare as we move into the yeah. electronic realm of things, um, you do physically destroy okay. what you have. Okay, uh, going to the 
page, and I'll see if it's the first page of the thing you provided on the third page. Next to the last page of the budget, where it's got stationary and supplies in the general fund. Yes. Number 7310, and then you jump down to 73101. Mm -hmm. uh, from 2016 to 2017, how, how could there be that much of a difference from 20,000 to 25,000? The only thing I can think of is maybe the vendor changed for printing the jury summons and there's an increase in cost or the current vendor that they're using increased the cost. Right. And I would assume that that's what that stationary and supplies for the jury pool is for. And then the next line, 73102, uh, passports, mm -hmm. uh, 2015, 29, 76, mm -hmm. uh, came in right on budget. Mm -hmm. uh, the 2016 and 61, 69, that's a sizable, I mean, increase. Increase. Yes. I know you're not responsible for the budget, but do you have any insight on what has caused that? Was there that many more passports? Well, if passports are costing us money, then that's the problem. Uh, this is for supplies, so take into consideration they may need new cameras, new printers, the paper, the printing paper that you print the pictures on, and all of that would be included into that number, I would assume. Jumping down to 7450 office equipment mm -hmm. maintenance. Um, actual was 16, so it was under budget. Mm -hmm. 2015, uh, but it's up again on 2016 to the original. I don't think the numbers for 2016 are out, but she actually spent on that. Okay. So I think she's carrying those numbers forward to 2017. Okay. Um, and it looks like she's just trying to adopt what she's used in the same, past instead of actually thing. reducing the budget. The next line out of copy release, mm -hmm. do you have any idea why it would go I know they added another copier to oh, the okay. office. Okay. They did? Factual? Yes. Okay. Okay, that's all right. So if the commissioners came in to Let's say you're elected and said, hey, everybody, all department heads have to cut 5 or 10%. 5 or 10%. Could you do both? Do you think, based on what you know about that department, is it possible to cut the budget that much? 5% um, for sure, 10%. Would that be a reach? 10% might be a reach, 5% for sure. And it goes back again to things that we're doing that we don't necessarily have to do. So that would be the first place to trim. And I'm quite sure we could probably take out a substantial amount of numbers for that. And do you, you see achieving that through the zero base budgeting uh, plan? Or is there a list that you have of Five, ten, fifteen, twenty things that you, like passports, you know, that you would cut out right away. And I would want to get in and evaluate what's actually going on. I've never been a part of the budget process for this office, so I would want to collect the data that she used to come up with these numbers, review it, um, and then go back and start reviewing the policies and procedures that are in place. There are certain things that can be streamlined, certain things that can be modernized. There are a lot of opportunities to save money. Uh, we go back to filing civil lawsuits and family lawsuits. We're issuing citations. We're sending those citations via mail. We're still printing them out. Um, we are in a digital era. We should be issuing those electronically and emailing them back to the attorney, getting them there faster. They're not. And that's not just a cost saving to the county, it's a cost savings to the party as well because they're not paying a runner to come pick up a citation anymore. We're delivering it straight to them. And there are 
I believe and I feel like there are areas in the office where the budget can be trimmed and it's just getting in there, evaluating everything that's going on, applying new processes to it, modernizing it. And did you pick up when you worked at the county clerk's office that a lot of those uh, processes are transferable in the yes. Mr. clerk's office? Yes, actually. Like um, a significant number or maybe a few? I, I think quite a few numbers could probably, or areas could be transferred over to the, not people, I'm just replicating right, right. their job processes is what I probably should say. Right. Um, I do believe that we do things quite differently now from the district clerk's office, and I think making our offices work similarly would streamline a lot of things. Um, there are things I have learned at the county clerk's office that I would like to see implemented over in the district clerk's office. Uh, working there has kind of opened my eyes to new ideas and new thoughts, and it's great to take that back across the street and utilize it. Um, and not just working in a similar angle, but working together. Uh, the county clerk and the district clerk historically have never really worked together, and to have that opportunity the magnitude that that would have on the county itself would be great. I mean, when you have two offices that basically run similar operations, when they're working together and in conjunction and they're talking about things that are changing and they're coming up with innovative ways to do them similar and save money, you're going to have a bigger impact. Okay, thanks. Um, you mentioned about um, having a good experience with the county clerk's office and you know, gaining more information. Um, you've also talked about some CLE credits. Um, what, what would you do to continue to gather information on how to improve the office? Um, so, you know, I am enrolled in college. I have been attending um, Lone Star for about three, four years now. I can't remember when I went back. Um, I'm studying criminal justice, which is something that has always intrigued me. Uh, my mom always said, you're either going to be a doctor or a lawyer with your handwriting. <laughs> so I picked the closest one. Um, but anyway, so I continue my education there. I look forward to finishing my associate's degree with an emphasis in criminal justice and looking forward to the future, um, hopefully being able to obtain a bachelor's degree in the same thing. Uh, that gives me a great knowledge to understand the justice system, not just the experience I have working in it, but it opens up to more of the legal terminology, more of how to figure, strategize, figure mm -hmm. things out. Um, continuing education, I feel it's imperative that you go to the conferences that are offered to you when you can, when it's affordable, obviously. I don't want to go and cost the taxpayers thousands of dollars a year for me to go if I can do it online or, you know, obtain the information a different way. But staying educated and attending conferences when necessary is very important. Um, also, there are lots of free avenues to choose from. The Attorney General has a website where you can sign up to receive AG opinions and requests for opinions so you know what other counties are kind of having problems with. You can see how they're addressing it, what the Attorney General said the appropriate way it was to handle it. The Office of Court Administration, which oversees the courts in our state, and they offer updates, news, uh, newsletters, things like that. They also send out emails at various times giving updates on legislative changes. And also, um, the district and county clerks have what's called a listserv where you can go within the community of the district and county clerks and ask questions if something unique comes up you can ask fellow clerks how they're handling situations okay flipped my mind when you said you've never been part of the budget process as far as as long as you've been in that office and every position you held office manager and all that and it's just incredible to me but that's a statement not a question the question has to more to do with the uh, the economic measures, uh, austerity measures, improvements, and all that sort of stuff. 
Um, you came through very strong in your answers on opportunities for improvement and uh, potential staff reductions, et cetera. Um, and I can see where, I mean, from a taxpayer standpoint, that is wonderful. But from the, the um, current staff, the 66 people there, uh, may create some uneasiness <laughs> and even some resistance and so how would you how would you how do you plan to deal with that there are a number of staff that are at retirement age or close to it so i see them retiring in the near future uh, maybe not this year or the next year uh, but their retirement is coming up and once those positions once they're retired from their positions obviously i don't want to go in and fire seven people um, that would just be heartless <laughs> and I would you know as people start to fade out or maybe someone quits and you know we don't need that position let's not fill it let's give it back you know look at things from a human standpoint as well but um, there are several that are I don't want to say aging out that just sounds <laughs> eligible <laughs> eligible <laughs> because I'm aging out as we speak but <laughs> um, People that are becoming eligible for retirement, and I, I would think that's probably the easiest way to eliminate positions is just as people become eligible and move on, let's not refill the position. Of course, that may not be <clears throat> optimal as far as skills needed, but that's a whole separate issue. Right. Okay, Bob? In line with that, um, there's some government entities that, that um, Part of their training is to cross train mm -hmm. so that one person knows how to do something that, that's their primary job yes. and then somebody else has the primary job but now they're learning to work back and forth with each Very other. Key. Is that happening currently or would you be willing to, are you thinking about doing something like that? During my term as office manager for that office, uh, cross training was very important. I tried the best I could to cross-train people when we had downtime. Um, I would even get in and do work for people so they could go sit with someone else and learn how to do that. I think it's key. You're, you're always going to have people that call in sick, people that are on vacation. There's unforeseeable things that are going to happen where you need other employees to step in. So cross-training is very key to the survival of any organization, I believe. So yes, I would, I would focus on cross-training. I would make sure that we have people to cover people when they're out, things like that. I'm sure Harvey plays, played into some of that as, as well with um, a lot of employees not showing up for work and when, when people need services, when the people, public needs services, <coughs> somebody needs to be able to, to provide them, so. Yes. <coughs> Thanks. About uh, five minutes. Okay. So after you get your associate's degree, where would you have to go to get a, a bachelor's degree? In criminal justice, Sam Houston is the top school okay. for our And you live in security? Yes. So you could commute up there? They actually have a campus here at Lone Star, too. Okay. I, I do the majority of my classes online. Mm -hmm. and rarely do I have to go to the campus. Ah. To, okay. I do what I can online. and. I try to schedule yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, if, the, if I have to go, it would be in the evening time. Okay. That, that really wouldn't interfere with, with your job? No. Okay. You know, back to the Swearinger case, uh, mistakes were made and the result was that the execution was delayed and there'll be months and months of redoing some things that have already been done and probably some costs associated with it. Are you aware of any other less significant errors? where things got thrown out of court or people had to do retrials and that sort of thing? Paperwork wasn't signed or was sent to the wrong place? Um, delays. Probably the most common would be with service, issuing citations to people. Uh -huh. um, temporary restraining orders are signed. You only have so many days that those are even effective for. Uh, so the delay would be if we didn't attend to it properly and it got delayed in service and then the attorney of course would have to reset the case to effectuate service and extend the TRO. In the clerk's office are, are there are there times when you have, uh, I'm sure there are, public information requests? Is that something that you yes. commonly see? 
open records request. Yeah. Yes. Is that something you see once a week or once a month? Or? Um, I actually handled those and it came in spurts. Yeah. Just depend. We could go months without one and then we could get five in one month. I know who's in most of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You're but you didn't okay. get anywhere you were in Mexico. <laughs> I want to jump back to um, I thought he was going to steal my whole question on the budget. Oh, wait, wait. He was shocked at the, at the budget process of the supervisor or the office manager or both not being involved in the budget process, mm -hmm. which shocks me also. Being 50 plus years in business and doing budgets, um, was that, is that a normal thing in, in, in the county government or is that a, a specific um, thing that uh, the current lady chose to do? I cannot speak. For the entire county because obviously I have only worked for the district clerk and right. now the county clerk so I don't know how any other office functions on that level dealing with the budget for the district clerk's office it has always been just the district clerk and her administrative assistant who worked on the budget the supervisors would get to request certain items if you needed a new scanner a new computer a new monitor things like that you would put it in at that time to get those Items, but the budget, budget process, oh, you, have, you have no input. No. Uh, did you do you find that that should change or not? I feel it should change. I think you should. It goes back to communication. You need to know what every department is doing. Um, are we saving money on paper? Or are we? How are we moving forward? How are we being innovative? Right. You need to keep up with that. And I think it in, it involves input from all of your departments. Very good. Interesting. We'll leave time for one more question. Give me a job. Always. There won't be over time. Um, so you mentioned that you do favor term limits. If elected, how long do you plan to serve? Um, I would like three terms. Okay. Four years apiece, right? Yes. Okay. And I think I think three terms is reasonable. Um, Obviously, it's going to take a lot to get in and evaluate what's going on and make the necessary changes, implement them, see them through the training, all of that. It's going to take more than one term to do that. And then I would like a term just to see it going smoothly. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Uh, we'll close on that note. And if you would like to do a closing statement, you're welcome to. I don't have a closing statement, but if you have more questions, I'm willing to answer. More questions? Mm -hmm. Well, on the sealing of the records, you mentioned about shredding paper, but now that everything's electronic, mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the footprints on electronic, and then who really has access to that in the county besides the district clerk's office? No one. Again, it's rights and rules driven, so you establish the certain rights for that uh, particular say an expunction. Um, so once the expunction seal is applied to the case, then there's only a limited amount of people that have access to that. Uh, once it comes to the time where it should be destroyed, it's gone out of the system. You can put the case number in and you're not going to get it back. You're not going to see the case and that's that goes across the board to everybody. Okay. Well, I'm thinking more along the lines of things that have been sealed, not necessarily sealed. expunged. Um, and, and I'm curious too about um, the county purchases the this software from mm -hmm. somebody. Right. And who's it, who's it purchased from? Tyler Technologies. Okay. And then don't they have some sort of access to it? Yes, they do. From their technicians do, they can get in. If we're having a problem or an issue, they can get in and see you know, and help us figure out what the issue is. Um, you grant them access? I don't think we granted them access. I think it's just given so that they can help fix the problems that arise. Uh, and, and I think it, they're based off of what type of problem you're having as to who you talk to, so they might have levels of access as well. Okay, so within the county, it sounds like you've got the district clerk would, of course, have access to everything, and then you would assign some sort of uh, different supervisors access to certain things. Right. 
And so there's a lot of trust involved with who has access to that, correct? Within the district clerk's office, yes. Mm -hmm. If the case is sealed, the only person outside of the district clerk's office that can see that case would be the judge. And the judges have access to everything? Almost everything. Well, like if one judge seals a case, could another judge get in and see that? Yes, because sometimes they sit in for each other. So they have to have access to see it. Okay. okay. And on, I'm sorry, Go on ahead. that, there was a committee that established those rights and roles and established who can see what. So it wasn't, it, it's, the judges had a great deal of input on what should be seen by who. Um, and the whole committee voted on it as a whole, who would see what and who wouldn't. If you're not an employee of the district clerk's office, you don't see a sealed file that's a district clerk file unless you're a judge. So it is, it is very limited. It, it isn't um, just because you're an employee, you're going to get access to a file. And that's a county decision? Of who gets in and who doesn't? It's the court data committee that yeah. decides so that. It's, so it's, it's the county, judges. So a court different court. county may have, di have different. Yes. Every county sets their system up differently. Hmm. Local control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one more. Okay. You said uh, on, on the how question for how will you improve transparency and access to the financial and other records for the public, you said, I would strive to improve the access to public court records. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? What specific do you have in mind? Uh, are there things that are currently, I mean, it sounds like you're pretty much rule driven. Uh, you don't, how would you improve access if it's already where it is? We are rule driven. Um, and Mr. Bagley kind of touched on this earlier and I don't, I don't think I answered it when he asked either. Um, the Supreme Court, came out with, when we began e-filing, they came out with a lot of rules regarding that, and a lot of it had to do with um, sensitive data, which would be your social security number, your date of birth, your driver's license, and documents that necessarily aren't sealed, but contain that information can't be published online. Therefore, they're not accessible unless you actually come to our office, sit at a computer, and we let you look at it. Um, to me, that kind of hinders the whole aspect of having your records out there. They're public record, they should be out there. And there are systems that are integrated with Odyssey that hold the original document in its place with everything there, but display a redacted version for you that take out that information. And protecting the taxpayer's privacy is key. I mean, this day and age, identity theft is rampant, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't be displaying those, that information out there. There is software that can be purchased that can uh, redact that information for you, but hold the original document in its form so that it is visible to the courts as it was filed. Just the public would see the redacted version where that information is removed. That, that software is also fully integrated with Odyssey. Um, it isn't somebody sitting there blacking out numbers, going through documents, or trying to, on the computer, black out a number that shouldn't be visible to the public. Uh, it, it takes the person out of redacting and makes it a computerized, automated system and flows behind the scenes within Odyssey, so it reduces uh, actual hands-on time trying to... Has there been any move to implement that yet? No. And, no but material. you think it's a good idea? I think it's a good idea. It puts the documents out there that should be out there okay. without the vital sensitive data that's prohibited by the Supreme Court. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming out tonight, for answering our questionnaire. Um, and we'll keep you um, advised of the progress as we go through uh, our process. Uh, our, we're planning to uh, release our results around mid-January in our January 15th meeting and vote on it then and then we'll release everything the next morning okay. uh, if, if the membership votes on it. So again, we appreciate you coming out and Thank good luck you. in your campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having me here tonight. Okay. All right.